morning. <clears throat> Om Asatom Asadgamaya Tamasoma Jotir Gamaya Mrityorama Mritam Gamaya Avir Avir Maedi Rudrayate Dakshinangamukam Tenamam Pahinityam Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Reach us through and through ourself and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet compassionate face. Let us sit quietly a few moments and meditate on the Supreme Spirit in any way we please.
Hadrangarne Vishruyama Deva Hadram Pashe Maksabhiryajatra Stirai Ranga Estushuvagam Sastanuhi Yase Madeva Hitayad Ayuhu Om Shanti 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 May we hear with our ears what is auspicious. May we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we enjoy with strong limbs and bodies the life allotted to us. Om Peace, Peace, Peace be unto us all. Swami Vivekananda and the Jnana Yoga Lectures. Everything that Swami Vivekananda did was extraordinary. You can't really say that one particular phase of his life and of his actions was more extraordinary than another portion of his life. He was such an extraordinary phenomenon. Of course, the traditional story of how Sri Ramakrishna managed to convince Swami Vivekananda to actually come to this world and do what he did. Anyway, without going into <clears throat> much detail, Sri Ramakrishna brought or understood that this personality, Swami Vivekananda, was dwelling in a very high spiritual realm, very high state of spiritual consciousness. And he found himself going to that realm and convincing the Swami to come down to this earth and take care of us, <laughs> take care of our future and set a new paradigm. New paradigm in the sense that it, it is not new, it is as old as humanity itself. But from generation to generation it has to be refreshed. That is the experience of people all over the universe, all, I mean all over the world. From time to time, a messenger comes to this human realm from another consciousness, from, a, from another sphere of existence. Not that it is physically a different realm, but it is a different spiritual understanding. Such a being is has understood life at its very depth, has understood the basic meaning that we're all struggling to understand, that we're all struggling to reach. He comes from that realm. He is immersed in that consciousness, immersed in that realm. And from time to time, such a being comes to the earth with a message and that message goes on vibrating for centuries and doing good, benefiting the people who hear that message. And so there have been many such in the history of the world. 
And those messengers of God, those spiritual incarnations, whatever, however you want to describe them, have been born in many parts of the world. Only a few probably are known. One would imagine that many more must have been there who may not have been remembered by posterity. Anyway, Sri Ramakrishna felt, I mean, Sri Ramakrishna was following the, the statements in the Bhagavad Gita that whenever yada yada dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata, whenever dharma, whenever righteousness, whenever positivity declines, and irreligion or contrariness, or however you want to phrase it, begins to prevail, then that reality embodies itself in, and manifests on earth in order to paritranaya sadhunam to save those people who are working for the positive, for, for the uplift, for goodness, for mercy, those people who are about to be overwhelmed by negative aspects become reinforced and the uh, civilization again takes an upward journey. So this is described in the Bhagavad Gita as a periodic phenomenon. And if you look at the history of humanity, you can see evidences of that. Anyway, Swami Vivekananda was in that realm, that consciousness, you, could, you need not equate them. You, we need not say that one such being is greater or lesser than another. They are all of infinite stature. Their manifestations may differ, but we, there's no question of equating the one to the other or saying this is more significant, this is less significant. For each age, a message is brought forth. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna is considered to be a personality of that stature. And one of the major things that he did in that function was to convince a great and dynamic and uh, enormously effective personality to come to this earth, to be born on this earth, to work for the welfare of all, of all beings. Swami Vivekananda, at the end of his, just before he passed away, he said a very extraordinary thing. If there were another Vivekananda, he would understand what this Vivekananda, that is himself, has accomplished. Now that sounds like a very, uh, very uh, strange statement to make. Anyway, if another Viveka, if there existed another Vivekananda, he would understand what this Vivekananda has accomplished. But then Swami Vivekananda said another significant, amplified it with, an, with another significant statement just after that. He said, but how many Vivekanandas there will be in the course of time? So he saw, 
the role that he had to play in this world. All of us have a role to play. And at some point in our lives, we understand, yes, this was a significant thing that I have done. It may be a very small, localized accomplishment, but this has been accomplished or this person has been made happy, or this particular purpose has been accomplished. Each one of us will have some such feeling. So in that sense, Swami Vivekananda saw this. If another such being existed, he would understand what this one has done. But how many such beings there will be in the course of time? Oh, the idea is that this sort of phenomenon takes place again and again and again. In the course of the infinity of time, there will be an infinity of such. So in that sense, we're all extraordinary. <laughs> There's no one exactly the same as any one of us. There's something that we accomplish in this world. And if it is something good and great and wonderful, we should be happy about that. But this is one aspect. And as time goes on, the same series of necessities and phenomena will come again and again. So we may have accomplished something tremendous and heroic, and for that we should, we should recognize that. That is quite legitimate. But we should never think that this is something that belongs to us alone. In the infinity of time, this sort of phenomenon comes again and again and again. Each one of us is extraordinary, but how many such extraordinary people there are. And in that sense, everyone is extraordinary. Extraordinary in different ways, but everyone is extraordinary. The, the Lord in his infant mercy did, did not take a rubber stamp and then uh, you know, create us like that, like you stamp cookies with a cookie stamper, so you get a thousand cookies of the same type. There are no two of us that are the same. Each one of us has that uniqueness, that extraordinariness. And that extraordinariness is due to the very fact that we are extraordinary in the sense that Within us dwells the infinity of reality, with each one of us. This is the message of Vedanta. Yad iha taramutra, yadamutra tadan viha. What is here is there, what is there is here. Mrityo samrityo maapnoti ya iha na neva pasyati. He goes from death to death, who, as it were, sees multiplicity here. At the heart of every manifestation, at the heart of this whole universe, is unity. That infinite, unchanging reality. Brahman. We give it the name Brahman, you, give it, you can give it any other name. So at the heart of everything that changes, there exists a reality that was never created. And because it was never created, it can never be destroyed and it can never be changed. That is what we call Brahman, that is what we call the infinite, the eternal, that is what we call God, but it is a, in the heart of each one of us. So one can then see Swami Vivekananda's statement, how many Vivekanandas there will yet be in the course of time. 
Now, the, uh, of the Karma Yoga lectures, I mean, Swami Vivekananda gave his main contribution, you could say, was this enunciation of the four basic types of yoga. Yoga <clears throat> is the union of the finite and the infinite. You can phrase it in so many ways. The realization that really at the heart of everything that appears finite, there is an infinite reality. The presence of God everywhere, so many ways you can phrase it. And great souls in all religions <clears throat> have experienced that, have experienced uh, the reality that is unchanging, that is eternal. So that is the basic message. And Swami Vivekananda codified the attempt to reach that understanding in four different ways as four different yogas or paths of union with that reality, with uh, experiencing experience of that reality, understanding of that reality. So karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga, the four yogas. Through one or more or all of these, Follow them and follow through one or more all of these and be free. That is the uh, uh, sum and substance of religion as Swami Vivekananda expressed it. Now, each of these yogas that he the lectures on these, each of these four yogas. Uh, certain extraordinary things were mentioned. And I think if one wants to, of course, his complete works now total nine volumes. So if one wants to get a summary or a if one wants to summarize the teachings that uh, Swami Vivekananda gave in terms of the yogas and in, in his own words, there are two particular lectures that uh, anyway strike many people as being extraordinary. And uh, one of them was given in San Francisco in 1900 Swami Vivekananda was in this city from February, I think February 22nd until sometime in early June of 1900. And he founded this society or the members who attended his classes wanted to form a society. So on April 14th, 1900, uh, they gathered together and uh, they asked him if it, if, if it was all right to form a group and a society, a class, to continue the study of Vedanta after the Swami had left the, the Bay Area because he was, he, there was never any intention that he would remain here for long. His mission was worldwide. So <clears throat> they formed this Vedanta Society. It was originally called the Vedanta Class. And then eventually uh, people from the East Bay uh, who had also attended his lectures uh, formed a center there. And then later on people in the Sacramento area uh, wanted a center, so it became Vedanta Society of Northern California, not just San Francisco. So he gave one lecture here before this Vedanta Society, and it's called, Is Vedanta the Future of Religion? 
in which he said, basically, he says, I don't know if it really is, but I would like to examine uh, what it has to offer and its possibilities and see if it can have a very wide appeal. Anyway, what he said during that lecture uh, were rather extraordinary things, and we're not going to have time to examine them, you know, in great detail this morning at all, but uh, it is one of the extraordinary lectures in the sense that he tried to put the essence of what Vedanta, the spiritual philosophy and practice known as Vedanta, what it can offer, what it has, uh, what its significance it has in the, in the history of mankind. And then there is another lecture which is also extraordinary. It was given in London on the 27th of October, 1896. Swami Vivekananda spent several months in England and founded a uh, philosophical society there. Uh, it, uh, it went through various stages of growth and decay, and, and there is now also still a uh, Vedanta society there in uh, London. Anyway, this lecture was given in, on the 27th of October, 1896, and it is called God in Everything, which is basically, in many ways, it's a statement of the first verse of the, it's an explanation or uh, amplification of the idea uh, the basic idea of the Isha Upanishad. Isha vasyam idam sarvam. Isha, by means of Isha, the Lord, by means of the Lord, vasyam is to be covered. Future passive participle, if any grammarians are present and listening. Most people won't even know what a future passive participle is, but anyway, is to be covered. Vasyam is to be covered. By the Lord, everything is to be covered. Everything that exists is to be covered by the Lord. Whatever in this world exists, whatever exists in this world is to be covered with the Lord. In other words, is to be seen as being pervaded by the infinite and the eternal. That is a profound statement. It's one of the oldest of the Upanishads. And it starts with this declaratory statement. Everything, whatever exists, whatever moves in this moving world is to be seen as enveloped by God, as permeated by the infinite, the eternal, the unmoving. That is the basic statement. <laughs> If you want one statement of what Vedanta is, that first verse of the Isha Upanishad is a very good uh, declaration, a very good summary. And this lecture, God in Everything, is a description, uh, a commentary, a, an elaboration of that idea. And if you think about it, this really is the heart of all religion. <clears throat> where is God? The answer to that is, where is God not? 
I mean, the very definition of God or spirituality or the, the divine messenger, or however you want to phrase it, is that there is really, that, that reality is present everywhere at all times. That what we see, we're looking at, whatever we look at, we're only looking at the surface of things. When you look at a, a person, you only see the surface of that person. Through their eyes, through their behavior, through the types of words they use, and through their, uh, the feelings they can somehow manifest, you go a little deeper than the surface. You can tell something about the mind. You can tell something about the heart of the person. Because a person has two basic, <laughs> two basic components. One is the mind, and the other is the heart. And Swami Vivekananda also made that statement that I would much rather have all heart and very little mind than all mind and no heart. Because it's the heart that enables us to expand. Where is God present? That frequently the statement is made, he's present in our heart. Which means he's present not in our ratiocination, not in our thoughts and conclusions and uh, all the uh, mental operations we undertake. He's present within us in that which feels most precious to us. Where is our heart? <laughs> where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And where is our treasure? Ah, that is the point. Where is our treasure? Our treasure really is deep within each one of us. It's deep inside. It's that inner feeling of I am. I am that I am. <laughs> When Moses was asked to go to Pharaoh, as described in the Old Testament, the, the Jewish people had been uh, taken to Egypt and uh, made to work like slaves in Egypt. And uh, <clears throat> Moses had been, uh, it's of course a long description of that in the Bible, Moses had been commissioned by God in this way. He actually was walking and he saw a bush was burning, which would not have been necessarily unusual in a very hot country. The bush was burning, but it was not being consumed. So Moses was extraordinarily curious about that. What is this phenomenon? And he heard a voice from inside the bush, and that is interpreted as the voice of God. And uh, Moses asked, you know, in response to the words that he heard, of course, eventually he was asked to go to Pharaoh and negotiate for the release of the Israeli people who had been made slaves. Uh, and uh, to, there are long stories there, which is the story of the, the Passover is all involved in this. But anyway, at this point, uh, Moses was being told what he was supposed to do and go to Pharaoh and do this and that. But why would Pharaoh listen to him? So he asked, whom shall I say sent me? <laughs> when he was asked to go to Pharaoh, who shall I say sent me? Who are you? <laughs> he asking the, the burning bush from which the voice came, who are you? And the answer was, I am that I am. Now that, you can say, I'm taking it out of context. Yeah, all right, I'm taking it out of context. But it is considered the Mahavakya of the Bible. Mahavakya means the great saying. There are four great sayings. Each of the Vedas has one great saying. I am 
Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi is one statement, Tattvamasi, you are that, is another such. There are four such statements. Anyway, it, in, uh, it is in that same sense, that statement in the Bible, when Moses asked, who are you? <clears throat> who shall I say has sent me to Pharaoh? The answer was, I am that I am. That is taken as a Mahavakya. I, that which says I am, that is the reality that is at the heart of everything. So these statements uh, considering, con uh, describing the highest uh, reality are made like this. And uh, this, although it is not considered one of these great statements, but it is, it has a quality, of, it has the same quality as that, you could say, that first statement of the first of the oldest Upanishad, Isha Vasyam Idam Sarvam, that all of this is to be covered by the Lord. In other words, the Lord God, the infinite, the eternal, is to be seen in everything. So where is God? <laughs> the answer is, where is God not? So these are the things. When we <clears throat> meditate, we're, this is the feeling that is supposed to arise, that the idea that that which we are looking for that which we have been looking for throughout our lives is within us, is at the very heart of our being. And if we can concentrate within that area in the very core of our reality, we will become in touch with that, which is the essence of everything and which is the goal of everything. Having attained which, Nothing more needs to be attained. This is another statement of the scriptures that is made. Having attained this, you have the feeling that this is the highest. Nothing more needs to be attained. So that uh, lecture, God in everything, is describes a lot of, uh, uses this uh, Idea. Swamiji elaborates on it in a very significant way. And then <clears throat> the, the other lecture that seems to be central or seminal to his teaching is this lecture that was given in San Francisco and uh, that is the, uh, you know, that is the, you could say Swamiji in a way was coming to the end of his teaching. He knew that because after he left San Francisco, he very briefly stayed in New York and uh, then he went to, uh, I think he might have stayed in Europe for a few days, but it was just a brief stopover. Went back to India, and in India, he had established already previously, he had established the instrument that was to uh, provide teaching. And uh, earlier, the Ramakrishna mission and uh, so his work was basically finished. So you could say, in a way, that this, uh, his time in San Francisco could be considered as being more or less the twilight of his teaching. In, and so it is reasonable to think that this lecture, which is so outstanding in many ways, was in the sense of a summing up message of uh, what Swami Vivekananda had to, uh, had to teach. Now, the point is I'm mentioning them so that 
you'll read them yourself because of course we don't have time to go into the details of that. But in this uh, lecture, God and everything, uh, sorry, is Vedanta the future religion? This is the lecture he gave in San Francisco. He made several points, which sound strange in a way. I'll tell you why they sound strange. So the first point was, he said, most uh, philosophies, most teachings in this world, religions, philosophies, and so forth, have a uh, <clears throat> certain characteristic in common. One is they generally have a book yeah, which they consider uh, supreme and uh, to embody the essential teachings. Second, they have a person who they think is uh, the embodiment of the principles that are being taught and through whose power, through whose grace, through whose help, uh, anyone who accepts that philosophy is able to progress. And then he lists a third thing. He says, many religions believe that they alone are true. In other words, others may be uh, attempts at spirituality, but they feel their own way, really. Even though they may acknowledge the validity of others, they feel their own way is really the best way. So these... Uh, these are three things which he emphasizes as having, uh, as being characteristics of many teachings. Then uh, in reply, he says, Vedanta does not believe in a book, which is, which is strange in a way, because we do believe in a book. <laughs> we believe in the Upanishads. But we will see what Swami meant, Swamiji meant. Vedanta does not believe in, in, in a book. That is the difficulty with starts, to start with. It denies the authority of any book over any other book. It denies emphatically that any one book can contain all the truths about God's soul and the ultimate reality. Those of you who have read the Upanishads remember that they say again and again, not by reading of books can we uh, realize the self. Nayamatma pravachanena labhyaha. This Atman is not to be attained by these teachings. But on the other hand, we do believe in a book. <laughs> we believe in the Upanishads. But the point is, <clears throat> we, we emphatically deny that the Upanishads will contain everything, that the Upanishads at the heart are, that the Upanishads are the one way, that, the, that there is no other way. There are many, it's like a mountain. There's a mountain somewhere and different people climb that mountain from different directions. Each one chooses their own path. They fight with each other because they think that they are on different mountains. But when they get to the top of the mountain, as they approach the top, they realize they see each other and they realize really it's the same mountain. So the point is, though we believe very much in the Upanishads that our basic teachings were uh, succinctly enunciated in the Upanishads, we deny that this is the only path, that all paths will lead to that goal. Ekam sat vipra bahuddha vadanti. Truth is one. That is our basic statement. Truth is one, but vipra, the, uh, the knowers of that truth, those who experience that truth, Bahudhavadanti, they speak about it in many different ways. 
So the point is we do believe in a book and we have, we hold the Upanishads aloft very nicely and say, yes, uh, the Upanishads contain, succinctly contain the truth that we are trying to experience. But we say that this same thing is expressed in many different ways. Viprabhuddhavadanti, those who know that truth, expresses in many different ways. Now, another thing Swamiji says uh, <clears throat> that veneration from some particular person is still more difficult to uphold. Those who, of you who are students of Vedanta, and by Vedanta, is always meant the Upanishads. That's a key statement. By Vedanta is always meant the Upanishads. Those of you who have studied Vedanta know that this is the only religion does not, that does not cling to any person. But we do cling to a person. We cling to five different persons. So what is meant by that? Again, it's in the same sense <clears throat> this is our path, but there are many paths to the top of this particular mountain. This is the path we have chosen. This is the path that is effective for us. This is the path that we claim to know something about, and we teach it, and we talk about it, but we emphatically deny that this is the only path. Although you will see that these five figures remind, uh, I mean, uh, signify many different paths. It isn't just the Upanishads and their uh, statements that are revealed. But even beyond these five, Brahma vid Brahma bhavati, the knower of Brahman becomes Brahman. This is the Upanishads. In other words, the Upanishads are, are a book that is not bookish, if you want to put it that way. It is a, a statement, a philosophy that is trying to express the broadest, the, the most significant, the, more, the essence of all reality, the, the truth that comes from all directions, from everywhere trying to emphasize the essence of that. So there is, you know, like this, this uh, <clears throat> Swami Vivekananda goes on to explain, I mean, this is Vedanta, the future religion, has many aspects, but the, uh, it cannot really be summarized, although it was one lecture. It would take a whole volume to even begin to summarize what he is referring to. But the idea is that, first of all, in the course of time, again and again, this reality is re-emphasized because in the course of time, there is a decrease in spirituality. There's an increase in its opposite. And again and again, the divine has to manifest and does manifest to teach to humanity all these things. So it is not exclusive, we cannot be exclusive. It isn't that one particular description exhausts the whole of divinity, that one particular formulation encapsulates the essence of spirituality. Again and again, this is expressed. Again and again, this is experienced. But the heart of the matter is sarvam kalvidam brahma. Sarvam means everything. Kalu, indeed, idam, this, is brahman. All of this is brahman. 
The, it can be phrased another way. We are not simply this body. We are not simply this mind. We have the body, we use it. We have the mind, we use it. We are the infinite and the eternal. That is the message. All of these expressions, all of these formulations, all of these things are uh, ex attempts to explain the reality of what we are. What am I? What are you? What is the essence of everything? Sarvam kalu iram brahma. All of this indeed is brahma. And that means at the heart of everything that changes, there is a reality that was never created, can never be changed, can never be destroyed. At the heart of everything that changes, there is an essence, a reality that is unchangeable. That unchangeable reality is what we are. That is our own consciousness. That is our own being, our own reality. Well, where is it? Everything I see about me is changing. The body is, uh, was born and is uh, growing and is getting older. The mind sometimes is very sharp and uh, intense. At other times, it becomes... Vague is constantly changing. All we know is the body and the mind, and they're constantly changing. So what is it about us that is not changing? That is our inner consciousness, our inner reality, our inner essence. And how do we attain that? That is the four yogas. Swami Vivekananda formulated it into four yogas. It's ancient. It's as old as the hills, as they say. All these yogas have been practiced for thousands of years. Swami Vivekananda summarized it at these four. Bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, raja yoga, karma yoga, all through one or more or all of these. Reach that infinite essence of your own self and be free. That is the basic message. The paths are many and they're suitable to each one of us. Some path or combination of paths, either through action or through meditation or through devotion or through knowledge or uh, intellectual understanding. The, each of these is a doorway to that reality which is our own inner essence. And Swami Vivekananda's description of these four yogas and his summarizing in, especially in these lectures, God in everything and his Vedanta, the future religion, emphasizes the fact that that truth is within us already. It is within ourselves. The reason we don't see it is that we have somehow not, we've lost the clear direction. We have a a fuzzy idea of what to do, <laughs> you know, where to go, what to study. We have some sort of a conception, but it is not very clear, and we are distracted in so many different ways. So concentration on that is what is called yoga, which, is, which brings that understanding to each one of us, can bring it to each one of us in all these different ways. Anyway, Swami Vivekananda is for us the one who has summarized so much of this and who has made who has made a clear channel through the exterior confusions to that which is the essence of ourselves. The subject next Sunday is Swami Vivekananda, the role of religion in modern education. Swami Tathamayananda will give this lecture. 
uh, there will be a question and answer session after this lecture in Vivekananda Hall. And all our lectures are also streamed and archived on YouTube, live stream and Facebook. Library and child care services are not available for the time being. All are cordially welcome to attend our services. Om Yohu Shanti Antariksham Shanti Prithivi Shanti Apo Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishwe Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redhi Om Shanti 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 <clears throat> Om Peace is in heaven Peace is in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. The herbs, the plants, and the trees are full of peace. The gods are peaceful. Everything in the universe is pervaded by peace. May that infinite universal peace enter our soul and being. Home, peace, peace. Peace be unto us all. <clears throat> 